All right, so uh, jumping into what I'm going to discuss, hopefully this will open. So I'm going to, come on, open. I'll just discuss a little bit about um, why we chose the name and what the history is. And primarily with Chardonnay, I'm going to talk about pruning and then a couple of things that is important to me, the mass selection versus the clone, our strategy for malolactic, and then other things such as wood and alcohol if we have time. And then I'll talk about Cabernet around site-specific winemaking, which is crucial uh, for me. Just quickly looking at uh, where we're located. This is my office where I'm sitting right now. This is the town of Healdsburg. This is where I live out here in Dry Creek. Healdsburg's really unique because we have Dry Creek, Alexander Valley, Chalk Hill, and then Russian River down to the south. If you go up Healdsburg Avenue, this is Simi Winery on the right. On the left, uh, you take the first right down Pasalakwa Road. Um, that's interesting. Uh, you come down this road, and this is the Pasalakwa Vineyard, or where we make set in stone. The whole valley is very interesting. The road is about five miles from Healdsburg Avenue. This is the Russian River. This side of the vineyard is actually in the Russian River, and this side of the vineyard is in the Alexander Valley. So quite unusual to have that situation. This is the Cabernet Sauvignon that um, you know, and then this is the Chardonnay. And so they're right next to each other, but they are in completely different appellations. The whole area used to be Pasalacqua, but then you know what the Italians are like, right? The, the uh, Segacios, the Mazzonis, the Petrocellis, the Foppianos, they all married in. And so today, <laughs> the, uh, the Pasalacqua ranch is relatively small. This is a combination of three of the Pasalacqua families here. And there's a sign right here with all the families on it. It's pretty funny. Um, time for another video. Uh, where did we get the name from? Obviously, the stones themselves. The vineyard has, I did not place those stones there, but uh, you can see that there's a lot of stones up here. Plus, it's part of, I tied in a little bit with what we do in terms of Chardonnay because we're increasing the amount of concrete. Uh, my first vintage in New Zealand was 1982, and we made wines in concrete fermenters back then. That was all we had. I'd never seen barrels until uh you know 90 until um uh 85 or 86 so you know we'd always made wine and concrete but suddenly concrete is cool and so uh hence the set in stone name the labels that you've all seen it turns out of course by chance is the fleur de lis which uh we've had commentary about as well this is a look at the vineyard this is the cabernet and we'll have a drone shot of that a little bit later and this is the Chardonnay is right here. So what's important to me is in the vineyard, I talk about mass selections, which I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail about. We talk about cane pruning, which um, I'll also demonstrate. And then over on the winemaking side, I wanna talk a little bit about malolactic and, and what, we, what we do there. So this is the Chardonnay that we're talking about. Hey, Nick Goldschmidt here. I'm standing out here in one of our vineyards and I thought that I'd just show you the difference between a split, horizontal split, and what we look for in our new vineyards, which is VSP or vertical shoot positioning. We're moving more and more away from this sort of architecture because we have to make bigger cuts and this is what we used to call spur pruning or we call spur pruning. And with big cuts, we get more utopia. On this side, we're moving more to this as we get global warming. This makes it more interesting for us. I only make smaller cuts, I don't get so much disease. I can prune a little bit later, so we've got the sap running, and then the buds push a little bit later in the season. So it's delaying maturity, and that's what we have to do as we go into global warming. Anyway, I'm gonna do a quick couple of videos on comparing pruning of these two types. Stay tuned. Nick Goldschmidt here. I'm here to discuss the difference in spur pruning and cane pruning. And this is an example of spur pruning. 
This is the spur that was left last year. It's a two bud spur. We had two shoots coming out of that. And this is what we call a water shoot or a non count shoot. So I'm actually going to take this one off this year. I'm going to take the spur off and I'm going to come back to two positions. So that's the way we prune a spur position vineyard. And you can see that uh, that process is very fast and that's the traditional way that it's been done in California and Australia. Um, we always joke that your IQ can be relatively low spur pruning, even the Australians can do it. G'day, Nick Goldschmidt here. I'm here to talk about cane pruning. This is the way we prune these days. This is much more tricky than spur pruning. It takes a little bit more intelligence. So what we do is we take off uh, from fruit from last year. I'm looking for two canes to lay down. So I'm taking off some of the uh, canes that we don't want for this year. I've got two that are identified. I'll leave a two bud spur position as a replacement spur in case I run into problems next year. So these will be the, the two canes that I lay down for the season. As you can see, it takes a little longer to pull all the wood out and you have to have a, a fairly good IQ and understanding what the architecture of a vineyard is gonna look like. I will be laying these two canes down for the vintage. And the advantage, the advantage of, of cane pruning is that the, the buds are spaced further apart so when it comes to putting the shoots into a vertical shoot position, um, which I, I do on other videos, we actually, it's much easier to get them straight. When you have a spur position vineyard, you have two, uh, two, sp two, you have two spur, two um, canes, two canes, two canes. So the congestion is much bigger. And this is why uh, cane pruning is a little bit harder. You've got to think about it a little bit more and, but, from a qualitative standpoint, cane pruning is better uh, than spur pruning, but spur pruning is a lot faster. Uh, 2018 was an interesting vintage, which is what we're talking about in terms of the Chardonnay. The, we had, obviously 2012 was the best vintage that we've had in recent memory, and then we had 13, 14, 15, 16. We had a little bit of rain in, at the end of 16, not much, but then 17, we had a ton of rain. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but the buds are formed the year before. So right now, we're actually forming the buds for uh, 2021. So as the, um, so it really depends on the season before, depends on how fruitful, et cetera, we are. So uh, 2018 was a big crop because 2017, 2016 winter, 2017 winter, were both wet. So 18 and 19 were a little bit bigger vintages, especially 18. But um, they tend to be more flashy vintages, whereas the, you know, really easy to drink early on, but the, uh, the wines that last a little bit longer, perhaps are the wines that are more elegant, the, the slightly tighter vintages, like 15 and 16, better acidity. This is a look at the Chardonnay, that's the Russian River. And I just want to jump into mass selections and why set in stone Chardonnay is so uniquely different to everything else. So you guys may have heard of uh, Marsal is another way to describe it. Marsal is the Spanish term for mass selections or field selections. So pre-prohibition, the Italians were planting vineyards, you know, was the way they did it, and, but they would interplant. They would plant Zinfandel with Carignan, with Movedra, um, and everything else that, uh, they could think of or lay their hands on. And these were like field blends. So they would uh, um, harvest them all together, etc. After prohibition in 1933, we started having uh, more vineyards being replanted, coming back into production. So people started separating the varietals. And I still have a bottle of 1934 Simi Cabernet, but more obviously uh, you'll recall BV and Inglenook, of course, started making Cabernet themselves in the 30s as well. By 1960, most wineries were then bottling and planting uh, vineyards separately, but the big change really happened in the late 60s going into the, into the late 80s, and that was the naming of these mass selections. And some of them, when I bring them up, will make sense to you. In 1988, 1989, of course, we had the resurgence of phylloxera, and so many things uh, changed at that point. Um, I'm going to come off here now. I'm just going to, it's, it's much easier if I draw this. 
So hopefully you guys can follow. You can see I've done a few of these talks. <laughs> on the... All right, so what happened was back in the, um, in those times, it's not like, so today if you want to plant something, you just go along to the nursery and buy a plant, okay? But in the 60s, we didn't have nurseries like, uh, like, you, like we have today. So people used to create plants for themselves. In the 70s, when I knew, kind of knew what I was doing, I, would, I could take a, a, a bud from an apple tree and put it on the pear tree. I could take an orange and put it on a mandarin tree. I can take a peach and put it on a, on a plum tree, etc. My mum would go, Christ, what's going on out there, you know? I get fruits on different plants. I know you guys are all watching television because you're goddamn Americans, but that's what we did for entertainment was uh, we'd get out and actually do stuff. So what does that mean in terms of, uh, of vineyards? Well, if you can imagine the, the way that we planted vineyards in these days was we, uh, we, as I said, we'd have to do it ourselves. So there was two pieces to the plant. There's the, the scion, which you guys all know what a sign is because that's Cab, Shard, Malo, Savvy. Well, that's Vitus vinifera. Vitus vinifera is what, we, is what we drink and what we talk about. The second part of the vine, of course, is the rootstock. Now, the rootstock in those days was two rootstocks. One was called AXR1 and one was called 1202. You guys have all heard of this, right? No? Yes? <laughs> Bobbing heads? Okay, so... It was quite easy. So in this, in the winter, we would go out and, and now when we were pruning, we would take a stick and on the stick would be three buds. We would collect 50 of them, we'd wrap them up and put them in a cool room. In the spring, we'd bring these sticks out again, we'd get a knife and we'd cut the bud out. It's called a chip bud. We'd chip bud the vine. Okay, so you get a knife, you cut the bud off. Then you take the rootstock, which has already been planted because we would do field budding, is what we used to call it back then. We take the AXR1 rootstock and we make a little T in it with our knife and we peel back the bark, exposing the cambium layer. The cambium is what we want to link with the chip bud. So, with the chip, it's the green piece of the vine. So, we put the chip in there, we tape it up, voila, we can grow Chardonnay. Make sense? Everything went really well. Until, as I said, in the 70s, winemakers started coming into the vineyards and saying, hey, dude, that vine tastes different to this vine and this vine and this vine. So one of the examples was, let's say, um, you know, uh, one of the characteristics was pineapple or, or tropical fruits, some of them were more tropical. So we go into the vineyard, we only take cuttings from those four vines and we would grow pineapple-y tasting vines, okay? And then we could reselect these three vines were more pineapple-y than everything else. And so this became, this became pineapple -y squared. And we had names for all these things. This is what a mass selection is or a field selection. Okay, so what we, what we discovered was if you had, if you uh, drew this, this is warm fruit and cool fruit, high in warm fruit would be like pineapple, melon, stone fruit like peaches and nectarines, uh, pit fruit, uh, citrus, and then grassy. Does that make sense? Warm fruit, cool fruit, okay? We had names for these mass selections, Spring Mountain, Rude, C, Wente, uh, Bado, Mount Eden, Calera, okay. So these were the mass selection names. So when you when you ordered a plant, you would say, I want to get C selection or I want to get Mount Eden selection or whatever you wanted. Okay, everything was really cool. 1989, Phylloxera came along and destroyed the AXR1 rootstock because we didn't know this yet again. The French had told another bullshit story. And the bullshit was AXR1 was not resistant to phylloxera. Somebody had blended vitis vinifera in it. When we took the mass selections and put them on the AXR1, these things were related. You know, sort of like Bob's family. You go along with family reunions to pick up chicks, right, Bob? Right, so 
you have the, uh, okay, that was funny. I'm laughing on my end, but you guys. All right, so we put the Chardonnay and we put it on top of the AXR1, and these things were kissing cousins. They were related, right? Get rid of the AXR. Now we start using Vitis Nebraska. So there's two forms of Vitis, Nebraska and Vinifera. Nebraska is bland, airy, repestrous, and all this other rootstocky stuff that comes from the east coast of the US or China. When we put these mass selections on top, guess what happened? We started to get virus. We got leaf roll, leaf curl, stem pitting, corky bark, and all these other viruses that started killing the vines. So the scientists said we can solve this problem. There's two ways to solve this problem. They went in the vineyard and they found one vine. This one vine didn't show any virus. And so they decided to take all the cuttings from that one vine and that became clone one. So unlike Bob's family, the definition of a clone is you know who your mother is. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still laughing. Okay, the second way to do it was Mary Stem tissue culture, and this is how I got into grape growing. So you take a leaf, and my second degree is in organics and biodynamics. Don't ever believe organic or biodynamics or call me and I'll talk you out of it. Anyway, so you take a leaf, you put it on an agar plate, you slit the vein, and you grow the vine. You take the tip, you grow the vine, you take the tip, you grow the vine, and what you're doing is you're outgrowing the virus. And that became clone two. Brilliant. So today, there's three forms of clones. There's the UC Davis clones, the Dijon clones, and the Espaguette clones from Italy. The problem, what happened is, you bred all the flavor out of it. This is why Chardonnay is boring as hell. This is why Chardonnay, how many winemakers get up and say, uh, I get white peach, I get a little bit of apple and pear. It's because it's all the same shit. All the Dijon clones taste the same. All the use, I think Claire, it's Dijon 76 and 95, it's all from the same plant. And that's why when you drink Chardonnay today, all the Chardonnay is between stone fruit and pit fruit. We bred away all this interesting shit that made Chardonnay from California cool. So if we were to grow, draw in here a uh, structure and texture, which are the other two terms we talk about. Today, all the wines are becoming more and more structural because they've got more acidity. And I'll talk about that in a second. But what you're drinking with set in stone is C. So we get this melon character. So if you were to drink set in stone, the flavor of the style of the wine is here. You still have some of the subtropicals and you still have some of the cool fruits. Does that kind of make sense to you guys? All right. Sometimes I get a little emotional. Passion, emotion. Right, so, oops. Um, so, this is a mass selection versus clone. So the mass selections were are still planted on AXR1. They tend to be smaller yield. They tend to be looser cluster. More importantly for me, uh, especially with Cabernet, which we'll talk about in a minute, they have thicker skins. On the clonal side, now remember why clones were chosen. Clones were chosen because they were strong. And so there's two things they're bred for. Yield, larger yield, and sugar. They gather sugar really fast because, you know, it's agriculture. We want to get this fruit in before it rains. So when you drink wines of clones, not only do they taste the same, but they also are produced for yield and fast accumulation for sugar. So it's very hard to get those things in balance. Um, I could draw you another chart of how tannins and, and flavor ripen. Maybe we can do that with Cabernet, but it's the same thing with Chardonnay and trying to get the, trying to get the, Alcohol imbalance with fruit and tannin is very hard to do when you've got a clonal situation. All you can do is pick earlier.
picking Chardonnay out here in the Russian River today. The guys are sorting through it. Beautiful, uh, beautiful little vineyard we're just wrapping up here and should get this fruit into the vineyard at the winery in the next uh, hour or so. It'll be fantastic. This is some of the best Chardonnay that we make. And uh, you can see we've got big berries and small berries going in, in the same cluster. And this is what mass selection uh, Chardonnay is all about. It's beautiful, beautiful fruit. Little uh, melon and, and uh, sub subtropical characters will come from this. Fantastic. No clones here, no clones. The other thing I wanted to talk about was, um, was malolactic. Uh, I did this last time with uh, with the Bronco group, so hopefully you guys can uh, follow this as well. There's, there's a couple of things you can say to winemakers to upset winemakers. How much alcohol is in your wine? How much malolactic do you use? What sort of barrels do you use? How many tons per acre? These are all the things that upset winemakers because every answer is a, bu is a bullshit story because all we're gonna do is tell you what we think you want you to hear. Like yield is really funny. If someone says to me, how many tons per acre? I look at them and go, how smart are they? Because if they're not very smart, I'm going to say two. You know, people think two ton an acre is better than 10 ton an acre. It's not true because quality and tons are a bell shaped curve. You just don't know if the bell shaped curve is like this or is the bell shaped curve like that. You can undercrop a vineyard just as easily as you can overcrop a vineyard. It's the same thing with malolactic. People say they, they love the term malolactic because they think they know a little bit about wine. And I'm here to show you, I'm gonna um, go through this quickly to explain to you, do not ask this question unless you understand the five uh, pieces of chemistry which are important. So the first thing you need to know, and this is the first question you should ask before you ask about ML. The first question you need to ask is when uh, whereabouts is the vineyard? So this is, you guys all know this, this is malic acid that goes to lactic acid, right? You've all heard of this. This is a, a bacteria fermentation. This is not jack in a box, right? This is bacteria you can eat. Right, so if you're in a cool climate, you start with four grams of malic, gives you two grams of lactic. You know, when Bob says, I want you to sell 200 cases of uh, singing tree chardonnay, you always go, now nah, 100 will do, mate. Bob won't catch me. So it's a half reaction. Two grams of malic gives you one gram of lactic. This is a cool climate, this is a warm climate. Which one's gonna be more buttery? Well, the cool climate, of course, because you've got more lactic acid. So the first thing you need to know is, where did you grow the grapes? Was it in a cool climate or a warm climate? The second thing you need to know is, when did you add the bacteria? So yeast is fermenting sugar to alcohol. When you add the bacteria, the yeast is um, the yeast is for many sugar to sugar to alcohol. When you when you put the bacteria in, the bacteria have a stronger affinity for nitrogen. Sorry, I'm getting different looks from you guys. Um, so the, the bacteria can eat the nitrogen more easily than um, the yeast. So the yeast go into stress. And when the yeast go into stress, they start producing reductive characters. And uh, I just can't get this thing to work. All right, sorry guys, I can't get the view to work. So the, the interesting thing is that when the bacteria starts producing uh, diacetyl, you've all heard the word diacetyl, which is the butter. The diacetyl has a couple of ON elements off it, which is nitrogen and oxygen. And you can, um, the, back, the yeast can then eat the butter. So the bacteria is eating the nitrogen, producing diacetyl, and then the yeast eat the diacetyl. So if you add the bacteria during the primary fermentation, you get less butter. If you add the bacteria after fermentation, you get more butter. Okay, so that's the second thing. When did you add the bacteria? The third thing is what temperature did you ferment it at? If you ferment hot, less butter. This other thing that people talk about all the time, surlees, aging, lees stirring, all this bullshit. You leave the wine on lees, you absorb butter. So the people that are stirring the barrel, 
they have a less buttery Chardonnay as well. What we do sometimes is we'll take the wine off, remove the leaves and put the wine back. And that way you can, you maintain the buttery character. And then lastly, and there are some really good brands that do this, and I'm not, I'm not gonna tell you who they are, you can probably guess for yourself, but some wineries are actually adding citric acid and malic acid to encourage more butter. So you can actually concoct this as well. So let's go back to the uh, screenshot here. Um, sorry. Oh, wow. Sorry, guys. So uh, how much malic did you start with? Uh, was it cool climate, warm climate? When did you add the bacteria? What temperature did you ferment it at? Did you leave it on leaves? And did you add malic or citric? So unless you understand most of the stuff, telling somebody it's 100% ML is meaningless because I can give you a wine that's 100% ML and it has no buttery character at all. And I can give you a wine that's 100% ML and uh, has nothing. So what we do with um, Set in Stone is we run it, we would say it's about 20 to 30% ML. Basically I let the, it's a wild bacteria. We just let it run through till uh, about February when it's still cold. So it's a very slow fermentation. And then in March, I add the SO2 for the first time because we're gonna bottle it pre-harvest. So it's, um, it gets some malolactic, but not a lot. So that's sort of the easiest way to answer it. But this is really uh, what you need to know before you start asking questions about ML. All right, let's jump into Cabernet. Any, any questions on Chardonnay? Bob, anyone asked any questions? No, we're all good? All good? Okay, let's talk about Cabernet. So in Cabernet, again, we're talking about mass selections. Um, we'll see a little bit about that. I'm very interested in the Piedmont area, which is the mid slope. I'm not a big fan of the top of the hills because the top of the hills generally have thinner soils, which means you need more water. Uh, again, we're talking about lower yields because we're using mass selections. The other key thing for me is the early harvest. I'm changing the way I farm so that I can pick earlier. It's, it's a little bit complicated, but um, I'm, I'm definitely getting my alcohols down. My goal is to get set in stone Cabernet down to about 13 and a half alcohol um, by, I'm hoping in 2021, the set in stone, we can get down to, down to third, under 14 alcohol for sure. We don't make any additions, we de-stem. The big thing for me on the red wines though is this extraction, because um, we're gonna talk about the end, the end result is this, this crusty thing. You know, you know how you sometimes see uh, crusty shit on the side of your bottles? That ain't happening with me, okay? So I'm gonna tell you how I avoid that. So what we're looking at here is a drone video. This, you can see, I'm, I'm gonna try and explain to you how we can make a really complex wine from a single site. And so this is an example of one site with multiple different soils. So you can see here, we've got very, very dark vines. That's because the canopy is, the canopy is bigger than the crop. So we're growing more canes, if you like. This is what we call the powerful piece of the vineyard. So that previous piece was the dense, this is the powerful piece. And this is the elegant. You can see that the vines here are less vigorous. And so they produce more crop relative to the canopy. Uh, I like zooming in here because, and Bob knows this, is because this car that I'm sitting in right now is my favorite car. It was a beautiful Suburban that I had for many years and my daughter wrote it off three weeks ago. Please sell some set in stone so we can help pay for the insurance. <laughs> All right. Good morning from set in stone, Cabernet Sauvignon, Alexander Valley. This is the day before harvest. Little east facing slope, which we like, of course, because that's morning sun we don't get uh, too much of the afternoon burn as we do on some vineyards but this is perfect relatively old vineyard planted in 1989 but this just beautiful hillside just amazing let's uh, zoom in and check out a cluster or two and so we can see we've got beautiful loose open clusters so nice even ripening and the yield here believe it or not is about two and a half ton an acre so very low yield Anyway, this is Set in Stone Cabernet Sauvignon in the Alexander Valley. Just a beautiful, beautiful day and a beautiful vineyard. 
Now, if I uh, showed you a photo of a clone of Cabernet, the, the, the cluster itself is really, really compact. So completely different look. Okay, so I'm just gonna jump off again here. Um, what I wanna explain is, John, you're not like, damn it. I can't get the thing to work. All right. What happens, the reason why we live in California, the reason why I work in uh, New World, especially Chile, Argentina, California, and New Zealand is because we live in earthquake zones. I don't know what the hell France and Australia is. They're big flat pancakes and all the damn soils are super old, okay? That's why when you looked at that vineyard, you'd see, um, let's see if I can do this. Uh, you look at these big differences in soil within the same block. So we have these like swales that run through. And so we'll end up picking that same vineyard three times based on the soil. And uh, so we can just throw a stone, it's gonna be a completely different soil. So it's important for us to keep these things differently. All right, in 1990, I got the job at Simi Winery. My first job was to blend the 1985 Simi Reserve Cabernet. What did a Kiwi know about making Cabernet? When was the last time you guys had a really good bottle of New Zealand Cabernet? It doesn't exist. So it took me three months to put the Simi Reserve Cabernet together and uh, it was not a very easy time, even though 1985 was one of the best vintages. So Zhao Malong, who was president of Simi at the time, most amazing lady, for those who don't know who she was, she's still my mentor, she's an amazing lady, probably one of the best, wine well, in the 80s and 90s, she's, she was the top winemaker in California. I drive around and, you know, people have forgotten who she is, an amazing lady, Google her if you don't know who she is. So she said, do you want to work with a consultant? And I was lucky enough to uh, work with Michel Rolland. It was the first time he'd worked outside of France, out of Bordeaux. And I worked with him for 12 years. He taught me it's got nothing to do with making the wine. It's all about sitting down and tasting. And he said, there's three sorts, there's three sorts of wines. And so on your tongue, there's the elegant wines, which provide the soft berry fruit on front of the tongue, the powerful wines, which provide the flesh and the richness, and then the dense wines, which provide the structure and the finish. And when you have these three things together, that's complexity. So what we started doing was sorting all the elegant wines separate to the powerful, to the dense, then we chose the best of each, made a blend of those. We had three wines, I was at the pub by five o'clock. Instead of spending three months, I'd done it in one day. So being the engineer that I am, I have to overthink this shit. I'm also firstborn, it doesn't work very well. Firstborn should never be engineers. So I had to start figuring out, oh, well then where do all the elegant wines come from? Where do the powerful wines come from? So let's just say, you know, you saw that dark green patch in that video that I showed. This is where the dense wine, the powerful wine and the elegant wine, because in the essence of time, I want to speed through this. So what happened was I'd go out into the vineyard and I'd go, oh, this is interesting. Uh, oh, I forgot to draw you one chart first so that you know what the hell I'm talking about. Um, can you see up here? Okay, if this is flowering and this is harvest, this is the only chart that you should remember how, uh, remember this, the, the, all the others you can forget. This is uh, acidity. As acidity decreases, this is what we call veraison. At this point in time, we get an increase in what we call bricks. You guys all know what bricks is because it's sugar, but bricks is a metric term. It's a beautiful thing. 10 bricks is 100 grams per liter. 20 bricks is 200 grams per liter. It's amazing. I don't know what the hell 2.37753 gallons per case is. I still haven't figured that out. Anyway, so flavor starts off relatively low and increases as we get closer to harvest. And tannins move from green, dusty, dry, and ripe. And where these three things meet in Bordeaux is 100 days. Make sense? Never happens. Because if it happened, you wouldn't need winemakers. You just do it by GCMS. So winemakers go out and they go, you know, in a heavy crop, Tannins take longer to ripen, and in a low crop, flavor takes longer to ripen relative to tannin. Leave it there. All right, jumping onto this other chart. So I go out into the vineyard. So I go out into the vineyard, and um, I'm in the 
I'm in the elegant vines. The fruit is always higher concentration than the tannin. So I want this distance to be huge. And so we can get to 145 days in the Alexander Valley. Now in the Napa Valley, <clears throat> it's, Napa Valley is warmer. So Napa, the cold air comes up from San Francisco Bay. So the sun shines on Mount St. Lena and that's what drags up the cold air. In the Alexander Valley though, we get the cold comes from the ocean. And so we get cold breezes at night, bringing the fog in at night. Okay, and then when we get up in the morning, the fog is still there. And the Napa Valley is not cooled until it gets sucked up the bay when the sun comes up on Mount St. Lena. So completely different strategy. And that's why Napa Valley is always hotter than the Alexander Valley. With powerful vineyards, the fruit and the tannin are in the same balance. And then a dense vineyard, the tannin is higher concentration than the fruit. So here we're at about 135 days. And here we're at 125 days. And this, this was the hardest concept for me to understand because I'd go to the dense vineyard and it would go green, dusty, dry, dry, dry raisin. Because the, there's so much canopy there and so little crop, it would, the vine is sucking from the, from the ground, the moisture from the ground, and then suddenly it's got no resources, so it starts taking from the cluster. And that's why the cluster raisins so quickly. So when we bring the wine into the, when we bring the grapes into the winery, we extract, don't worry, I'm getting to the crusty shit point in a minute. When we bring the grapes into the winery, you've got the, the, uh, the seeds, you've got the cap, and you've got the wine. And this is why you use punch down pulse air. Oh, you can't see what I'm doing. So you've, you got punch down pulse air or um, pump over because you want to mix this piece of the tank up where the skins and the wine are in contact because this is where the yeast are having a party. There's lots of resources there, there's lots of sugar, and it's nice and warm. So, with an elegant wine, I do standard American fermentation 30 degrees Celsius. If you want to convert, you add 15 and double. I give it more air, more pump over time. And during maceration, I cool down to 18 Celsius. If I did that with a dense vineyard, you can imagine what would happen. The vineyard would be, the wine would be totally undrinkable. So with a dense vineyard, I ferment at 22 Celsius, less air, less pump over. And then during maceration, I increase to 26 Celsius. Because what I'm trying to do is soften the tannins. I want to unload the tannins from the wine. So you remember, I'm going to give you one little bit of chemistry. You ready? <laughs> you guys remember what a, um, a flavanol is? Remember your chemistry? A flavanol or a malvitin 3 glucoside? You guys remember this stuff? This is why I'm not in sales. <laughs> I don't know how to sell shit, but I know how to make one. So this is the basic, you guys, have been, what I'm gonna draw you right now is what you're selling. And you guys have never seen this. This is crazy. Right, so what this is, this is the flavanol that goes into making wine. This, this is called an anthocyanin. This is what you sell. This is purple. See these two hydroxyl lines here? OH. H, OH plus OH gives you H2O plus another oxygen molecule. So this oxygen molecule cleaves off. We get an oxygen molecule and then we join on to another anthocyanin here. So what that what does that mean to you? That means that. An anthocyanin plus an anthocyanin is a tannin. You provide more heat, light, air, and time, that compound gets bigger and bigger, and you get crusty shit here, especially in Southern's warehouse. You know how wines move from purple to red to brown to orange? My wines will go purple and red. They will not go brown and orange. So when Kim Jong-un drops the nuclear bomb on California, and we all run to the bunker, 
and you don't show up with a bottle of set in stone, you're wasting your goddamn time. We want these wines to live. We want them to be young. We want them to be... We are in a... This is great, man. This is a fruit business. We're not in the alcohol business. This is a fruit business. So we want the wines to taste fruity. And we want them to live. And we want to enjoy them. They've got to be from a place. And they've got to have a story. And there's got to be a person. And this is the beautiful thing about wine, man. I made beer for three years. Guess what I'm going to do tomorrow? It's the same as I did yesterday, which is the same as I did the day before. I get to tell the story once and I make the wine, beer exactly the same. There's no uniqueness. It's like vodka. I used to work for LVMH, remember? Tanqueray. Liquid inside a Tanqueray cost 10 cents. Anyway, off the subject. So, sometimes I get carried away in case you didn't know. Conclusion. Uh, G'day, Nick Goldschmidt here. I'm sitting here with three glasses of wine and everything we do is single vineyard and the way we get complexity out of a single vineyard is by choosing blocks and styles or working the wines to the way the vines best exemplify themselves. So when I was young, I walked into a room once at a pretty well-known winery with 200 wines on the table. I'm wondering how am I going to blend 200 wines? I came from New Zealand, I didn't know anything about Cabernet. And so working with a consultant, we figured out the best way to do this is to put them into families. Elegant wines, which are the soft berry fruit wines right up on front of the tongue. The powerful wines, which provide the fleshiness and the richness. And the dense wines, which give us structure and power. So when we go ahead and line all those wines up, I sorted all the elegant wines together and I, made a, I chose the best elegant wines and made a blend. I got the best powerful wines and made a blend, the best dense wines and made a blend, and we had three wines, all from the same vineyard, all from maybe in the same block or not the same block, but all from the same vineyard. And then we made a blend of these three wines, and it was the most complex wine that we could possibly make. So today I continue that process with elegant wines, we can extract them a little bit more aggressively because we know that the tannins are in a lower concentration than the fruit, so we can extract more tannin. Whereas on a dense wine, if we made wine like that, they become too dry and too tannic. So we lower the extraction and try and make the wines more fruit forward. So if I was to drink an elegant wine, I'm gonna get more red cherry, great structure, very forward in the mouth, very, very elegant, very, right but good acidity red fruit and very forward in the mouth the powerful wine i can immediately get it it's more black cherry a little bit of walnut and the mouth is really rich really full powerful not a lot going on in the front of the mouth not a lot going on in the structural part of the mouth either And then the dense wines, much more chocolate, a lot more black cherry, but all finished, very supple tannins, good structure, good acidity. And so when we put the three together, hopefully, and it's never 30, 30, 30, because in a warm vintage, I probably want a little bit more of the dense component, whereas in a cool vintage, I want more of the elegant component. So it really depends on the vintage. And when I put all three together, we get the most complex wine we possibly can from the same vineyard. And that's how we make single vineyard wines really complex. So just wrapping up uh, the Chardonnay, the current vintage is the 2018, of course. The current vintage on Cabernet is 2017. The wines are all one vintage, one variety, one vineyard, they're all vegan. I don't blend across anything, this is pure. Um, we are certainly not using the whole vineyard yet, so we've certainly got room to grow. And uh, especially in the Cabernet production, it's it's a pretty big vineyard. So uh, and it's a really cool vineyard. It's one of my favourites. Uh, this this is a real story. It's a real place. It's real people. So we really encourage you to come out and visit if you have. We'd obviously love to have you guys come and visit. But if you've got customers as well, and they're heading up into wine country, please. Uh, please send them our way. Uh, we're open door policy and uh, we would uh, really value uh, meeting your clients. Uh, I've been working on this vineyard since 92. I've been working in the Alexander Valley since 1990, but 92 on this particular vineyard. The neighbors are all people that you sell against all day, Lancaster, Silver Oak, Robert Young, AVV, Foray Corona, of course. Currently there are limited releases, but we, as I said, we, we're, only, we're limited to the vineyard, but we've got room to grow. 
And if you have clients that want to do individual, you know, if you want to do retail store customer based, which I'm, do I'm doing, I don't know what you guys are doing, but man, I'm doing a hell of a lot of them on the East Coast right now. A lot of retailers are doing at home tastings. We can get 40, 50 uh, customers for retail stores just drinking a couple of bottles of wine each night. It's amazing how much interest that's garnered. So those are all things to consider. And then these are my contacts. I, um, I will send a link to the YouTube channel for you all. And I will, um, there's a separate page just for Set in Stone Wines. There's about 15 videos up there now uh, for your use. And if there's something that you want me to do specifically, I uh, have tastings of, I, I, there's three sorts of videos that are up there. The first one is a tasting of the wine, of course, for each vintage. We've only done one so far. Secondly, uh, where the story comes from. And then thirdly, the rest of the vineyard uh, videos are all of the vineyard itself. So um, I hope I didn't uh, expel too much passion that I, uh, that I got through to you guys. But I really, uh, I'm really on it. You know, I've, I've always heard about you guys. And I know how bloody strong you guys are in the, in the sales arena. And so I'm bloody honored to be able to actually have a wine with you guys so i'm extremely passionate i'd love to work with you guys so uh you know anything you can use me for in the future or any questions you've got please reach out uh for me um and uh hopefully we'll take it from there so good luck and if you've got any questions i'll come off i'll stay online for about another 10 15 minutes bob i'll hand it over to you yeah i was just gonna say yeah if you have any questions for nick um we did this a few weeks ago 